All right, so today I am with Jake Pippen from Bonterra Winery, and we're gonna talk a little bit about Bonterra and the wines that they produce, but a little bit more importantly, and focus perhaps on, on sort of, you know, where Bonterra fits in the world of, of uh, viticulture, the, the actual grape growing and farming practices that you guys use. So Jake, if you don't mind, just actually introduce yourself a little bit, tell yep. us where you fit in the winery, and, and then we'll talk about the winery itself. Yeah, so my name is Jake Pippen. I uh, am the portfolio manager for what we call the Origins Collection. So uh, a variety of wines from our three origins, uh, which include our biodynamic wines um, from Bonterra. And, uh, but I, I dabble in all sorts of things with uh, education presentations, things like that, when it comes to the full suite of, of wines that we have from Bonterra to, you know, Casa del Diablo to Don Melchor to our biodynamic single vineyards. Cool. So, so just uh, for for uh, to explain that a little bit, um, Bonterra is a winery that is owned by whom, and then by whom? So, Bonterra is a winery owned by Fetzer Vineyards. Uh, so, it was kind of a natural extension of the Fetzer family's, uh, you know, kind of desire to really invest in sustainable agriculture back in the '80s. Uh, but I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, but Fetzer Vineyards is owned by the Chilean winery called Conchi Toro, and they purchased Con uh, Fetzer, Fonterra, and the related brands back in 2011. And since then, they, you know, Conchi Toro has been a large proponent of sustainable agriculture. They have their own kind of Fonterra-esque winery called Connoisseur down in Chile, yep. uh, as well as the world's largest biodynamic vineyards uh, for with Emiliana. So it was a really natural extension for them to, you know, seek out and work and purchase Fetzer along with, um, you know, all of the practices and um, that Bonterra has become well known for. Right. I've actually, uh, I've actually been to Chile and been to Connoisseur. Oh, uh, excellent. Okay. So, so I've seen the biodynamic practices and the, and the viticultural and winemaking practices there. This was in uh, 2009. So I think before, okay. before the acquisition of Fetzer. Uh, Correct. But, uh, but, but the practices are basically the same. So let's, let's kind of dive into that a little bit. Where, where is Bonterra located? So Bonterra is located kind of right in between the towns of Hopland and Ukiah in Mendocino County. Okay, um, so Mendocino County has always been the home of the Fetzer family, Bonterra, but Bonterra specifically is located in a little box canyon, um, kind of up in the foothills, about 20 miles inland from the coast as the crow flies. Yeah. And a, a box canyon is essentially a three-sided canyon with one entrance, um, hence the box. And we're just tucked right back in there. It used to be an old sheep farm used to be an old cherry orchard. So this land has kind of always been under some form of agricultural practice. Um, it's just recently that we've converted everything to, not even everything, but a small portion of it to vineyards. Right. So, so I would imagine, you know, and we're going to talk about bon, um, biodynamics here in a second, but being in that box canyon probably has some good benefits as far as, you know, the requirements to be, uh, to fulfill biodynamics, uh, because you don't really have probably a lot of neighbors in that canyon, I'm guessing. Um, Correct. So you, yeah, you, I mean, we, we have a few, but it's pretty much just us. Yeah, so what I'm getting at is you can kind of control the environment a little bit more. You're protected from influences from neighbors with, you know, um, drifting, you know, products drifting over with the wind or whatnot. You know, you know, you've got that natural protection, so it makes it easier. So let's... Exactly. So you're in Mendocino, north of, uh, north of really Sonoma and Napa, so Northern California. Correct. Um, and, uh, and when did Bonterra really kind of become... An entity become you know uh, a wine producing entity. So 1987 was when Bonterra started, and it was about 20 years after Fetzer was founded. So right. it you know as I alluded to, it it really evolved out of an organic farm that the Fetzer family had on the property that they used for as part of their culinary center. So they had a culinary center. They wanted to use organic vegetables. That was they were the Fetzer family was part of that kind of back to the land movement in the 60s up into Mendocino. And their ethos was, you know, really as Barney Fetzer described it, you know, what's good for the land is good for the grape. What's good for the grape is good for the wine. And right. that very basic sort of premise really guided their their eventual embrace of organic viticulture. And it's not that it didn't they didn't embrace it before, it just didn't have a name. Right. And, you know, organic viticulture as we know it nowadays, that wasn't the saying really in the sixties with it with a title and a name and certifications that just didn't exist. Right. Um, and biodynamic even more so. Yeah, no, I, you know, biodynamics is something that really was kind of, you know, codified, if you will, back in the 1920s. But, you know, from a from a global perspective for farming, it, it really didn't kind of take off until much later. And obviously organics 
Um, you know, we can kind of debate whether or not it's been used as a, as a marketing tool more than actually anything, but, you know, there is a big difference between the organic. So maybe real quick, just tell us, yeah. if you don't mind, the difference between what an organic farm would, how they would function or what they would look like versus a biodynamic farm. Sure. So um, the, they're, they're similar, but they're very different. So essentially organic um, and an organic facility like ours requires a certification by a certifying body. So in our case, it's the um, CCOF, the uh, California Collective um, Organization of Farmers. And they essentially certify not only our winemaking facility, but our vineyards themselves. And um, so we produce what we call organically grown wine. So our wine itself is not organic wine, but the grapes going into it are organic, which I know can be a little confusing, but in the eyes of the USDA, basically what that means is our wines, which are made from organically grown grapes, have slightly higher than the 100 part per million sulfite requirement to be considered an organic wine. Okay. And sulfites, you know, there's, well, we can have a whole debate about that. And, and, you know, there's a lot of opinions out there, but essentially in a nutshell, sulfites act as a preservative. They're naturally occurring and, you know, winemakers will add them to, you know, in addition to what na is naturally produced to help stabilize and a wine when it is on the shelf. So it can last longer than just a few weeks or a month. Right. Um, biodynamic, on the other hand, is, and I use this phrase kind of tongue in cheek, it's almost, it's organic on steroids, except there's no steroids involved. You know, <laughs> organic is generally certified by a state agency. It can go all the way up to a federal agency in the States, but Biodynamic, on the other hand, is really certified by and organized by Demeter. And Demeter is an international um, nonprofit that certifies not only products, but land, agriculture, everything. And it's not just associated with the wine industry, um, but there are considerably more stringent requirements. You know, so for organic, for example, we can't use pesticides. There's no Roundup. There's no anything like that. You know, we want to you know, use naturally occurring products to know, mitigate whatever issues come along in the vineyard, be it, you know, uh, a, a fungus or a, you know, insect infestation, whatever it might be, we use naturally occurring products um, or beneficial bugs, ladybugs to, you know, take care of a problem. Biodynamics, on the other hand, really breaks that down into much more stringent um, kind of parts. The largest component of that is everything that ha organic has, biodynamic has, but or Biodynamic, excuse me, takes it another step further. So we have to set aside at least 25% of our land to a natural state. That we can't, you know, if we have a hundred acre vineyard or a hundred acre plot of land, only 75 acres of that could be planted to grapes. The rest has to stay in a natural state to foster biodiversity. And in addition to that, you know, we have to have an animal component that acts as part of our practices. You know, in our case, we use sheep. And, you know, not only do sheep help fertilize, but they mow for us in the winter. They go through and they pick up all, you know, the grapes that we left behind that didn't make it. They love it. Um, they get to run out of the vineyard for the winter. Right. But it also helps us, um, you know, naturally fertilize, but it doesn't compact the soil. Whereas if you're running a tractor through there year Much in, year yeah. out, yeah. that soil starts to get compacted. It starts to become a less ideal home for beneficial bugs, insects, bacteria in the soil, fungi in the soil that is going to act as sort of a natural protectant of our land. We want to foster biodiversity, and that's one way that we do it. Right. Um, in addition to that, gets into the whole, you know, practices about, um, uh, you know, the phases of the moon and, you know, the cow horn. I mean, to some people, biodynamics can get really woo-woo, but it's all really based in science. I mean, Rudolf Steiner, Dr. Rudolf Steiner, that developed biodynamics back in the 20s and the practices was really looking for a sustainable way to grow vegetables, grow, you know, to, to, you know, he didn't really buy into that, what came out of World War I, that, uh, you know, massive amount of ammonia and other chemically man-made fertilizers to boost crops, because it's good for a little bit of time, but what about 20 years later, 50 years later, 100 years later, just, it's not sustainable. Yeah, no, I mean, my, my understanding of Steiner is he kind of grew up uh, originally in a rural area during what was essentially the industrial revolution saw the changes right. that happened in the late 1800s early 1900s and created this sort of philosophy based on really what he had you know from the more rural and traditional farming areas that he had come from and applied them after you know he, it was a reaction after to this this you know huge um increase in 
<laughs> using these agrochemicals to, you know, for fertilizers that people kind of quickly realized, like you just said, we're, we're not going to sustain the land. They were good for growing a few years worth of crops, but really tired it out because you were, you were just kind of dumping all this, you know, not natural stuff on it. So biodynamics is, exactly. is his reaction or his, his answer in a, in a broad sense to kind of go back to creating that self-sustaining ecosystem, essentially that a farm would have been, you know, prior to the industrial revolutions that, that happened in the 1800s. Exactly. And that's a great way to kind of succinctly say it. It's basically a farm and the way that farm was before the industrial revolution, before agrochemicals kind of poured in, it's, it's a closed loop system. You know, yeah. our inputs to our system are the outputs from the system. We try to create a very self-sustaining biodiverse environment that you know fosters whatever product we're you know grapes in this case you know right. we want to benefit the grapes but we also want to benefit everything else that uses that environment to to live and exist that also help us right yeah so so just in a nutshell the difference is really kind of maybe in in, in a couple sentences i think between uh organics is you have a list of of inputs that you can use that so long as it's approved and it's on the organic list you're okay but biodynamics is well you don't really have to have inputs or you shouldn't have to have inputs because we sort of develop a way to self-sustain using things like compost, using the sheep to kind of recirculate the energy that's in the, in the ground and the plants and everything back through to manure to, to help kind of fertilize everything. Okay, cool. So, exactly. so yeah. you guys, you guys at Bonterra, you have, um, I think you told me you have five farms or five we, properties that you work with? Correct. So we have five different ranches, um, ranches that we farm as biodynamic ranches. And, you know, we call them a ranch because there is an animal component to it. We actually, just about a year ago, we got cows that to help with our compost program. You know, we don't let them run amok in the vineyard because they just destroy things. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, they, they are an animal component that is very beneficial to our composting program that we then use in the vineyard. Um, but we have the five ranches. We have nearly 3,000 acres in all that we farm biodynamically. Right. So, so you have uh, all those vineyards that you farm biodynamically. Do you have any other vineyard sourcing besides that? Because Bonterra is not, I mean, is, is all the fruit that you produce go into Bonterra and that's it? Or do you, uh, do you have no, other farms you uh, work with or other ranches you work with? We have other ranches that we work with as well. So, you know, we have three single vineyard biodynamic wines that only come from three of the ranches that we farm. But Bonterra and our, we have other organic vineyards that, that we also farm that we just haven't converted. Uh, which is a three-year process right. uh, to convert from organic to biodynamic um, that, you know, for our Chardonnay, for example, you know, uh, the original Sundial Ranch from Fetzer, you know, yeah. there along the Russian River in Mendocino. I mean, I should have worn my shirt. I have an old Sundial shirt. Um, it's not going to shells with Sundial and, Chardonnay. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, you know, that is one of our organic uh, um, vineyards that we've converted to organics, but we haven't yet converted all the way to biodynamics. However, it does abut one of our vineyards uh, called the roost um, for our roost chardonnay. So we kind of split it a little bit, and we like to just see how things go. Right. And so in Mendocino, you guys are growing pretty much common grape varieties that we would, we would all be yeah. familiar with: Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay for the whites. I think for, any other whites that you guys produce? Those are the uh, ones we, we do actually. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay are the you know kind of standard ones. We also make a Viognier okay. um, in limited quantities. Uh, we also grow Marsan and Roussan as well up okay. in our. Um, uh, Butler Vineyard, which is kind of way up at the top of the Box Canyon at about 2,200 feet in elevation. Uh, we don't, you know, do any um, uh, single bottlings of that, unfortunately. I keep asking Jeff, I'm like, Jeff, please make a Marsan Roussan blend. I think that'd be really killer. Uh, and we also make a um, uh, dry muscat as well that we grow mm -hmm. up in our, um, which we actually do bottle. You can buy it on the website, but we don't uh, sell it um, to our, any of our wholesalers. We just make a pretty small quantity. All right, that's cool. So, so those grapes like Marsan, Roussan, actually Muscat, and and Viognier, those are all grapes that relate back to like the Rhone River region in France. Exactly. They're pretty, pretty durable from a from a from a climate point of view because they're used to being grown in in relatively warm and fairly dry climate conditions like in the Rhone. So it seems mm -hmm. like it suit biodynamic farming. You're probably not doing irrigation, and no. you're you know dealing with climate change. Mendocino does have elevation, so you get some cooling temperatures, but there is some of that also in the Rhone Valley. So it kind of makes sense. And I think you also now changing over to red grapes. We'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, you guys grow Syrah and some other Rhone varietals too, as well as Merlot, Cabernet, and and Zinfandel and some traditional varietals, right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, we have your you know your host of you know classic California varieties: Cabernet, Zinfandel, Pinot Noir, um, Merlot. But you know, in addition to that, 
particularly in our Butler and McNabb ranches, we're growing Syrah, we're growing Mouvedra, we're growing Grenache, and we're even growing Petit Syrah. Um, you know, I like to say that some of our blends, because um, the two biodynamic wines that we have are reds that are blends is a, essentially a California Rhone blend and a California um, Bordeaux blend. And why I call them California blends is because each one of them has a little bit of Petit Syrah in there. Jeff Sayhockey, our winemaker, is a big fan of Petit Syrah, um, just to kind of add that tannic backbone little color as well yep. Yep. and um uh, because of that you know we can't they're not traditional Rhone or Bordeaux blends but you know they sometimes get you know three four percent petit on them modern Cali interpretations that exactly yeah that uh, we actually even have some Malbec up there as well uh, it's a pretty versatile little vineyard um oh. so you know, for Malbec... example so, oh, so, so so I'm just going to say does Malbec get uh, where does that get blended does it go into like Cabernet or one of the other wines that, that we might come across? Yeah, so it goes into our wine called the McNabb, which is our okay. uh, Bordeaux blend. Um, yeah. So, you know, classic Bordeaux varieties, Cab Dominant, Cab, Cabernet Sauvignon Dominant, a little Cab Franc, um, Petit Bordeaux, Petit Syrah, and then a little Malbec. Nice. Each year it's a little different, but it's always at least 50% caps off. I guess the last question I have is is really about climate change and how you guys are dealing with that. Obviously, it's something that's been very, very much in the forefront of topics lately. And, and, um, you know, we've seen we've seen California fires, floods, rain, snows. Everything seems to happen these days in California. And yeah. uh, so, so with biodynamic and organic viticulture, where you're not able to sometimes use some of the more modern uh, vehicles, like maybe irrigation things like that, how are you guys dealing with um, you know uh, uh, the stresses, I guess, of of all of this stuff with and, and the biggest impact I think with with climate change really is just the just the incremental increases of, of the overall temperature every year drying things out, which then relates to that. <laughs> yes, it, it is. There is a host, a myriad of problems that we face. They, I mean, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, oh, it's always going to be like insect or pest related. And, you know, honestly, if you have a healthy, diverse ecosystem like we've created in our ranches, that's never really an issue. Um, it's things like fire and right. You know, for example, if as things continue to dry out in a traditional vineyard, and I'm making generalizations here, but those tend to be very water dependent vineyards and there's, n there's no riparian area. You know, it's essentially a, a very dry vineyard that you have to irrigate and there, there's no sort of natural green protective, you know, border around this, which, you know, we're required to have with part of that 25% uh, riparian natural area set aside, that acts as a fire buffer. You know, the, we, by able to, you know, increasing soil fertility, increasing our biodiversity, not only in our soil, but in our surrounding area, that increases the water content and the water sort of storage capacity of our ranches, thus really helping mitigate either big spikes when we have droughts in California, or in just, if a fire does come through, it's much less likely to burn, right. um, you know, than an environment that's just been cleared and starved of water for the exception of a crop that you want to grow. Right. And that acts as a really natural, you know, it, it, there's there's not only benefits to the product and crop we're growing, but to the, to, to the greater environment that surrounds us. Um, you know, one of the avenues that we've taken, particularly water is such a big component to this, particularly in California, in it's boom and bust cycles, where, you know, if it doesn't snow in the Sierra with and have a good snowpack, there's going to be, ramifications on down the line, you know, from fire to drought to, you know, lack of water or decreasing water table in the valleys, et cetera, et cetera, because it's not replenished. Right. We've invested in a lot of, you know, water recapture and just water sort of mitigation techniques. You know, we actually, we have this giant, I, I call it the pit, and it's um, full of these little tiny red earthworms not your traditional like earthworms you would use fishing, but they, we take our must, we take our compost and our, you know, everything when it goes to a crusher destimmer, we put it in there. We also run our gray water through there because it takes a lot of water to make wine, but these worms help break all that down. It helps clean our water. And we've been able to reuse about 3 million gallons of water every cycle, every, every harvest to, you know, clean our tanks, put back into the vineyard, what, what have you. Um, so it's little steps like that that has been incrementally getting us further and further along to become a more self-sustaining kind of ecosystem. Right, which is which is at the end of the day the goal for biodynamics. So yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's great. I think I think people don't really quite realize sometimes how 
how how much this world actually functions on on the um, or is dependent on functioning of little critters like worms and stuff. I mean, we've been so focused, obviously, the last year on viruses and stuff, but yeah. there's there's a lot more to our our own sort of uh, echo diversity out there that we're we are really dependent on that we don't actually see or consider on a regular basis. So, all right. Oh, absolutely. Go. So I guess I, I said last question a second ago, but one one little final question is: um, Are you changing? uh or, or making selections on grape varieties based on the climate change like are you are you seeing a shift are you testing out different grapes based on the need to um you know combat you know heat and water stress and all that kind of stuff we uh, that's one of the reasons that we have kind of a diverse array of grapes planted in in our because we we one want to see how they perform over time like things have changed drastically from when Bonterra started to now even in the 33 years that it's been yeah. and um you know jeff and joseph our director of viticulture um they are trying out different grape varieties that's one reason we started using petite syrah it does very well in these climates um you know particularly as things get hotter on the flip side and literally like you go down south to chile country toro is has a very state-of-the-art innovative research center where they are doing research on drought tolerance of Cabernet clones. So everybody in, you know, that is a big Pinot fan or Francophile knows about the clones of Pinot Noir, like Dijon, Triple Seven, you know, so on and so forth, Pomard, Badensville. Well, Cabernet has clones just like that, but it hasn't really gotten the genetic research that Pinot Noir has. And one of the steps that Conchi Toro was taking is we have a big test vineyard down on Maule, which is pretty similar to Mendocino climatically. Yeah. Um, it's you know wet enough to dry farm, but it 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 still has those spikes. It gets really hot in the summer, and it's pretty mild winter. But what we're doing there is test plots of different Cabernet clones to identify which clone is going to perform better under drought conditions and under water stress. Thus, can we begin to graft our rootstock? you know, pick our rootstock and then use this particular clone with this rootstock in vineyards that we know are going to have a water problem. Yeah. And it's it's little things like that, that Conchitoro as well as, you know, there's been a considerable amount of input from Joseph and Bonterra, um, you know, with this project to look at just water stress in vineyards and how we can use the existing genetic material of the variety of clones that are out there that can help kind of shore us up so we can continue growing some of the classic varieties. Which is um, which is going to be love. yeah yeah exactly what I was going to say. People are still going to want to have Cabernet, and they're not necessarily exactly. about your clonal selection. They just wonder why you don't have Cabernet. It's like well, it's too hot exactly. to do Cabernet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, there's always that component of there is what we want, what the environment really wants us to grow, but then what people will buy. Right. And you know, there is a fine line that we can wade where okay, if you get the right clonal material for a Cabernet for for drought conditions, which is what we're seeing more and more in California. Okay, well, we can still grow Cabernet um, instead of switching to something that, you know, maybe like Petite Syrah that does better in those conditions typically that people are like, oh, I don't really want a full glass of Petite Syrah, you know, it's, I know. it's a little much. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine. Small steps. Yeah, I can imagine trying to uh, change the shelving in some of the box stores or wine lists over from Cabernet oh, man. to Petite yeah, Syrah. It's like, <laughs> nah, not going to happen. So, all right, cool. I appreciate that. So, um, I read that Bonterra is the number one selling organic brand in the United States. Is that, is that the is. case? All right. That's the case. So you guys have done a good job. You've marketed it well, uh, but backing it up with with uh, practices that, uh, that make sure it carries forward. So um, appreciate it. Uh, appreciate the time yeah, today. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. My pleasure. Absolutely, Brian. Um, cheers, everybody, and uh, enjoy. Thank you.